We've got Kathy online, possibly Paul coming online in a moment. We've got our four lovely speakers here and um, the mics are being in the process of being turned up and we'll look for the first question or comment from the audience in um, just a moment so if you've got one put your hand up just a very frivolous one maybe to start the ball rolling if uh, barbara uh, were alive today where would she go on a package holiday? <laughs> now that, that is a fascinating question, isn't it? So, should we start with our panel? Any thoughts from our panel? Well, probably not Italy because she's been there many times. Perhaps to France, Barbara? Oh, Kathy, hi. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, Paula. Hi. Hi, Barbara. Hi, <laughs> Lucia. You. Do you know what? I think she would go on an adventure tour to Africa. Yeah. And I think she would really love, um, you know, the easier sort of travel that we have nowadays. Um, and I think she'd be itching to actually go on a, a tour of sub-Saharan Africa and go and see the Yoruba people, I think, for herself. So I think she'd like to do that. Well, obviously, me being Japanese, I'd like her to go to Japan. <laughs> I'd, I'd like for her to go to Paris. <laughs> or maybe the Bahamas to see Skipper's house. Because, of course, he didn't invite her, which made her feel rather sad. And he invited other people that made her feel very sad. Um, I found this wonderful online video of, of Skipper's house. I was just Googling around and thought, I wonder whether the house is still there. I'd love to see it. And I Googled and this amazing video of the home he was raised in appeared. And it was this gorgeous colonial pink mansion looking out over, over the sea. And it was really, really beautiful. And I know Barbara longed to meet his mother who was very eccentric. Um, so I think she might take a cheeky little trip to the Bahamas and look at the place that she wanted to be invited to, but wasn't allowed to go to. <laughs> Um, not so much a question, more of a comment. Um, I just wanted to thank Barbara for her talk, which was absolutely brilliant, absolutely fascinating, as they all have been. Um, but I have quite a good example of the impossibility of turning English into French, <laughs> which is Walter Scott's novel, The Fair Maid of Perth, which becomes in French, La Jolie Fille. <laughs> which doesn't quite work. That was, that was all, really. Thank you. I'm sure you're often asked which is your favourite Pym novel, but I'm going to ask which is your least favourite, the one that you sort of think, oh, I feel like reading Barbara Pym again. Oh, no, I won't read this one. I'll put it back on the shelf. That's a, an interesting question, isn't it? Um, how about Paula? Would you like to start with that? <laughs> it's very easy for me. Um, it's Quartet in Autumn, which I know critics think was her best, but I just find it too sad. And it's it's sort of quite depressing as well, and all those lonely people. I always think of Eleanor Rigby when I when I read it. I was thinking about all the lonely people. Where do they all belong? All the lonely people. Where do they come from? Um, and although I know I appreciate its brilliance, um, I do tend to turn to Pym for comfort reading. Many of us do. I think in the same way I turn to Jane Austen. So I love the sheer comic brilliance of some Tame Gazelle. Um, I think her masterpiece is *The Sweet Dove Died*. But Quartet in Autumn, I find painful to read. Hmm. Thank you, Paula. How about Bethany? Well, I don't know. To tell you the truth, an academic question, civil to strangers, those are ones that I haven't reread, reread, reread. So probably one of those, because all the other ones, you know, I love to read over and over again. So. Yes. Yeah, maybe an academic questions. And but I understand that in you know, a in autumn, I love 
that, but at the same time, it's a bit too sad. So it's like love and hate sort of thing, I think. No, I agree with Barbara. I civil to strangers and, uh, you know, I just don't reread that. But Paula, I love Quartet in Autumn. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> That's the beauty, Kathy, that we all can pick and choose our favourites. Right. And, mm. and also, I think somebody made the point yesterday, which I thought was a brilliant point. I can't remember who made the point, I'm sorry, but a brilliant point that as one ages, sometimes the love, right. the novel that you love becomes a different novel. Certainly for Jane Austen, for me, that has changed throughout the years. Um, at one point, you know, the first novel I read was Mansfield Park, so it probably is my favourite, but as I get older, I appreciate persuasion much more. And I think the same for, for, for Barbara Pym. I, I wonder whether I'll come to really appreciate Quartet. I, I appreciate it, but I don't love it. Um, but I think it changes as we change. And I think that's the mark of a really brilliant novelist, because um, you're always in that relationship. And just, just a comment about Civil to Strangers, somebody really needs to re-edit that, because it, I'm sorry to say this, but it, it, it's not well edited. And when and um, the home front novel, which would have been brilliant, I'm so sad she didn't go back to her home front. It's so funny and so brilliant. But I hadn't realised with Civil to Strangers that it, it's clunky, and then you don't get a sense of which expedited passages are missing. So it's it's easy to get a very wrong impression of Civil to Strangers. Um, I hadn't realised it till I looked in the archive, but somebody out there really does need to to re-edit Civil to Strangers, in my opinion. You can disagree, but yeah, that's that's absolutely fascinating, actually. So maybe that's that's a challenge for us to uh, find somebody to re-edit it. Um, I think certainly for me, I think my least favourite is. I echo what some others have said, is it's an academic question because I think that she'd clearly, as, as I said in my talk yesterday, she clearly was trying to sort of make her novels, you know, a bit more swinging and a bit less sort of cosy. And in an academic question, it doesn't actually work. And I think having a principal character who's a mother and she doesn't get it quite right, it just doesn't, it just does not work for me at all. So that's one that I haven't reread. Um, you know, I read it initially, but haven't gone back to that. Um, so I think that would be um, my conclusion. But, you know, I love Quartet in Autumn. I think it's quite possibly my favourite uh, because I think she got it exactly right. You know, it's very much a novel of its time. You know, it's very contemporary. It's very up to date, but it's still definitely Pym. So I think that that's her sort of real masterpiece. Um, but it does, you know, when I think about the um, the dirty cat bowls under the sink, that just really sets me off. And it, um, so, um, and it is, you know, it is incredibly beautifully written. So um, that would be my favourite. I found it interesting that Quartet in Autumn has been mentioned as least favourite and most favourite, yes. because a few years ago, I can't remember how, I heard on a, a programme on Radio 4, about people discussing novels and somebody chose Quartet in Autumn and I thought, oh, this is good. And Fiona Bruce was on the panel <laughs> and she absolutely rubbished it. She could not see anything in the book at all. She found it dreary and not interested in the characters. And well, that finished me for Fiona Bruce. I, <laughs> <laughs> I hope it hasn't put anybody else off Fiona Bruce. <laughs> she does the antiques roadshow. <laughs> hello, 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 panel. Um, this is this can either be a frivolous question or the opposite, really. But I know lots of uh, my friends here and my friends who aren't here often have a PIM moment or a PIM experience. I woke up to one first thing this morning when I heard on the, on the headlines that the Bishop of Ebbsfleet had gone over to Rome. <laughs> and I thought, how, how lovely that in 2021 this is still speaking to me. Um, and uh, happy or less happy, has, can the panel give us any examples of pin times, pin moments they've had? Um, I don't have like a 
pin moment because my life is full of pin moments. Um, I have a great friend called Sally Bailey who lives in a boat in Oxford and she's also a huge pin fan. And we just realised that most of our lives just seem to descend into pin moments. And she recently went to stay with her foster mother and she said, and she rang me, oh, Paula, my life is just it, again turning into a pin novel. I've just been to a jumble sale. <laughs> and she said, and look, all these awful women. <laughs> and she said, and, I, and so it just seems to be a succession for me of pin moments. But I think what's lovely about your question, Paul, is, and I know I'm certainly not the first or last person to say this, but it is such an identity, Pim's world is such an identifiable world in the way that Jane Austen's world is, it's self-contained. Or we might think of P.G. Woodhouse, I guess. Um, and I think she's one of the few comic writers where that world is so contained and, 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 and is full of those, I would think sometimes bittersweet pin moments as well. And, and you know, I, those quotes about tea and, you know, Mildred saying, am I always going to be caught irreverently with a teapot every time? You know, there's uh, those wonderful moments in, um, to do that, I suppose essentially British things, I think. I live in America now, so I'm having less pin moments, it must be said. But there's something very quintessential about that world that we all recognise, which is to do with a certain kind of, I think, very British behaviour, actually, and sort of does seem to centre around teapots um, and caterpillars in salads. I'm not sure how that, talking about translation, how the comedy always translates it, 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 to our American friends. Um, I've speak to a lot of my American friends about how wonderful Pim is. I'm not sure the majority get her, really. There seems to be something quintessential, but I think like my I don't have a single moment, but I think my life often sort of descends into semi-farcical Pim moments. Thank you for that. I think we can um, all identify with some of those, I think. But can we have, um, actually, we have our um, two other speakers who are joining us uh, remotely, who are both from um, overseas. So we have Paul, who's uh, British, but um, in the Netherlands, and we have Cathy um, in the States. So um, perhaps could we um, ask Paul, um, please, do you ever have any PIM moments? I suppose I would say yes, because I've trodden in her footsteps, as it were. So um, my memories of the International African Institute are uh, recalled instantly when I read a, a Pym novel. Um, it, it's even the, the, the smell of decrepitude and dust around the 210 High Hoban offices, when indeed everything was falling apart and uh, an era had ended and people didn't quite know what to do with themselves. I think that's why I find <laughs> Quartet in Autumn such a, a, a deeply meaningful book because it, it really does capture not only the lives of the individuals, but it captures a change in where Britain was and how it was relating to the world and so on. But I suppose I now will have a PIM moment because I quite often use the Eurostar to come and go uh, between Netherlands and Britain. And every time I pass through Ebbsfleet now, I will remember that um, <laughs> news item that's just been reported. Thank you very much, Paul. And Cathy, yes. do you have PIM moments? PIM moments? I, I often do with my children my daughter and my grandchildren one of my daughters especially and my son as well we all have rather i don't know if it's quirky senses of humor but um often situations i mean whenever we're together it's just sort of like one-liners the way pim often is too with with odd unexpected uh very funny uh events happening so i i really enjoy their company partially because of that i suppose it's just uh you know we all joke a lot and they're they're sort of off i don't even know how to describe them but not not quite normal <laughs> jokes they're just quips so uh, yes i do when i'm with my family <laughs> thank you and beverly well, I have kind of a weird pen moment, and this happened a couple of weeks ago. I have a friend who lives in New York, and he's a big Pym fan, but he's just started kind of rereading her novels. So we were walking it in the evening um, after having dinner, and you know, everybody's out in the restaurants and stuff like that. We're talking about Pym. And all of a sudden, I wanted to tell him about Miss 
um, Miss Pryor, the little sewing woman. And there was, there's one line that I think is so funny in it. And I, I was gonna tell him that line, but I was laughing so hard. I could not get it out and the tears were coming down my throat. And I said, so I finally stopped on the sidewalk and I said, it's when Miss Pryor is trying to comfort Belinda after she's, you know, the caterpillar thing. And she says, um, she says, well, I'm going to Mrs. Hockleaves to run up a few uh, spring or dresses for her trip to Carlsbad. And, and Belinda says, well, you won't get a caterpillar there. And she turns and she says, well, that's about all I'll get. And then he says, between us, Miss, Miss Bede, uh, Mrs. Hockleaf does not keep a good table. I don't know, for some reason, that line just made me laugh so hard. And I said to my friend David, I said, isn't it amazing that a writer can write one little thing like that? And here I am standing in the middle of New York City all these years ago, laughing hysterically. And what a gift that is that she gave us. You know, just a few words. And Maiko. Yes, um, actually the whole conference is really like Tim moment for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, you know, I was given this sort of in a pack, welcome pack, and look at it, and then said tea and biscuit everywhere. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is really like a Tim moment for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I definitely echo that. I think um, for me, um, I'm under normal times. I'm I'm a chorister, church chorister, and I spend a lot of my time flitting round the shires, singing choral even song at different churches. And the thing is, it doesn't matter which church I go to. As soon as I'm in that church, I know exactly where to go to make a cup of tea. So you put me in any church hall anywhere, I instinctively know which cupboard the tea bags are in. And that sort of feels like a really sort of pimish sort of thing, really. Um, and it's odd that all my other fellow singers don't have that knack. It seems to be something that I've sort of absorbed over the years. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do we have any more questions, observations, thoughts? <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I wondered if any of the panel shared with some of Pim's characters the um, propensity to come up with appropriate quotations for whatever was happening or being said. Um, because this is one of the things that first attracted me to Pim's novels, because I constantly have quotations buzzing around my head. Um, so do, do any of you also have this um, habit? I do, much to the annoyance of my friends and family. <laughs> okay, other panel members, any thoughts on this? I, I, it's funny because I was in a little charity shop a couple of days ago after I got here, and this wasn't a PIM quote, but it seemed like one that she would have written in the notebook. There was a, a lady who came into the charity shop and she asked if, uh, I don't know, Susan was here and she said, yes, the, there were another woman. And I said, and how about um, uh, Linda? She said, oh yeah, she's here. And she said, oh good, two birds with one sweep. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's like something I would have written down. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a new one. <laughs> Anyone, Paul? I, I think Anyone? Uh, I was going to say that um, I think that people's um, ability to quote from literature is much reduced from what it would have been um, at the time some of the novels were written. But you will get people quoting from popular culture, like I did this morning when I said, settle down now, and I couldn't remember which comedian had said it. I think it's more likely nowadays that people would would quote from TV shows or something, which are very transient, really. Um, not, you know, not with the staying power of, of English literature, but um, you might have little, well, you might all have little pet sayings like that. I bet Paul has got a few from the sort of Lancashire um, area. I bet, they've, I bet they've got a few things that oh, they, uh, yeah. yeah. I definitely, I think um, one of, when I first started working on, on, on the book, a lot of the Irina's sayings were my mom's sayings. 
um, and not just quote, lovely quotes from hymns, but you know the sort of getting over a broken heart sort of quote along the, the you know plenty more fish in the, in the sea, but much more. I mean, it, particularly in Liverpool, there's a wonderful, colourful language. And I could really relate to, to Irina. And I know there were times when they drove Barbara mad when her mom would sometimes say the wrong quote that wasn't suitable for her. But it really related, I just kept relating this to my mom. My mom had this saying that we, there were seven of us and she never had to lay a finger to discipline. She used to, all she had to say was, little apples will grow again. That's all she ever said. <laughs> and it was like torture. It was like mental torture. She'd just say, don't worry. You know, she'd say, do you want, do you run, run an errand? And we'd all say, no. And she'd say, fine, little apples will grow again. And then we'd go, don't say that, because it would make us feel so guilty. So she, she ruled us <laughs> by this rod of iron that was so kind. And it was just this, you know, what was it? Oh, she'd say, uh, you know, if you, if you said something that you were sort of exaggerating, she'd say, oh, I've heard ducks quack before. <laughs> and I, and I <laughs> felt that she'd reduce you to that, you know, because she knew you were exaggerating. And I, and I loved Irina's, and there are many, many of them, too many to quote, but I really heard those sort of Lancashire Scouse, uh, Northern women, sort of no-nonsense, you know, those sorts of quotes. And I think um, we find a lot of them, don't we? And, and in those early fragments, and like the Homefront novels and some of those fragments in Civil to Strangers, where you get more, I think, of Irina's character in some of those, some of those fragments. Um, so I, I'm always, I, you know, my head is full of mainly Jane Austen quotations <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but I think Barbara's definitely invading my brain um, so I do, I do, and P.G. Woodhouse, I've always got a good apposite quotation of Woodhouse. But I can see how people do become very, Pickles has a pen quote for any given situation because he knows all the books by heart. I'm not quite there yet. I hope I will be. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anyone else from the panel? Any thoughts about quotes? Any quotes you use on an everyday basis? Well, uh, uh, it, it, um, it, it did occur to me while you were speaking that, in fact, I'm absolutely unable to make an accurate quote from anything. Um, <laughs> and I suppose this is because when I was a child, I was brought up in a strict uh, biblical environment and had to learn verses week after week of the Bible. Um, some of which I can still quote. If you want me to quote the Bible, I can I can do it. But almost anything else I read, but anything I read for pleasure, I simply can't quote it. But one of the things that I, I do hear all the time in my head is my grandmother speaking, and she was full of quotes, and she was very similar in that she had all these pithy statements that none of us really quite knew what they meant. And in fact, some of them were dialect words, which you have to go to a Lancashire dialect dictionary in order to find out the meaning. And it turns out it's ancient Danish or something. Um, so those stuck in our heads as sounds and particularly sounds that we, we didn't know the meaning of. So they're like jingles, they, they earworms, people call them, they get into your head and you can't, you can't shake them out. Um, and it, it may well be that Barbara Pym was picking up on a lot of that in her own upbringing, that she had a, a good sense of those rather strange things that people say that you don't quite understand what they mean, and it, it somehow fits the situation. Um, and I think there's a lot of um, modern linguistic anthropology which is, is very aware of the performative character of language. It's not what the words mean, it's actually how you do the saying. And um, I, I think she had an ear, she had an ear for that sort of thing, and it, 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 um, it, it's, it's attractive in her writing. Yeah. Uh, I think we, I don't she would have loved my grandmother. <laughs> And I think some of the, the immortal saying of my husband can't take toad, which is like my very favorite, or, or should it be mon mari ne peut pas prendre les saucisses? Supporter. 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 Okay, right. Yeah. So, um, you know, that sort of, you know, phrases like that, I just feel sure that she must have heard that somewhere because that is such a bizarre <laughs> saying that you know it sounds like those sort of things that you would have heard 
you know, in a national restaurant in sort of 1943 or something and sort of tucked that away to use later. Because it is, you know, a phrase of such incredible brilliance that no other author could would ever write that, I think. <clears throat> so. was, it in the, was it in the, you remember seeing it in the archives? In like any of the notebooks, that particular quote? My husband can't okay. toad. Uh, no, I didn't see that one actually. I didn't. I was also just as you think. I was. I was thinking about Irina saying God works in a mysterious way, mm. which when, when Paul was speaking about that biblical upbringing, um, those words you hear they might annoy you at the time, and your mum says it, and then you get old and you mm. actually think that God does work in a mysterious way. You know, they sometimes <laughs> it, it, it comes home to you. But uh, but there were definitely phrases that she would hear, she would hear people saying and then write them down. And, um, but I love, I, I mean, I love all those. I, I, I think that was wonderful what Paul said about the ear for music. It's, it's, it's actually very musical. Um, and, so, and some of the quotes, because they're hymns, have a musicality mm. and a rhythm um, and that wonderful pace that you, it probably did, her ear was cultivated probably at a very mm -hmm. young age. But, and, and by the church influence of her mother and being an, you know, all the organists uh, being a church services and hearing <laughs> those cadences, because the sentences are very, mm, they're, they're, they're gorgeous, mm. aren't they? You know, the phrasing of them and da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. I'm, I love that sort of rhythm of some of the phrases are really gorgeous. You know, in, uh, there's somebody on Twitter that does PIM quotations and just occasion it comes up on my Twitter feed and there'll be this most felicitous phrase that you might have missed when you've been reading the novels and then you suddenly see it in on its own out of context and it, it's like a musical refrain I mean, it's a beautiful you'll suddenly say oh how did i miss that you just suddenly see it and it's so exquisite and i really understand what paul's saying about hearing that but, you know it, it, you know it's an extraordinary thing if i if i might if i might if i might say so um, Kathy in the past has often regaled us with um, Mrs. Morris from um, uh, Excellent Women. And, and Mrs. Morris was an actual cleaning lady who uh, was employed by the Pym family in Oswestry. And of course, she was Welsh. And I think there's a lot that, that could be a lot of where she's picked up a lot of this. And she probably did say, I think there's a drop of milk left in the jug. <laughs> And, um, and, and we'll all be kissing the Pope's toe before you can say yes. knife. <laughs> um, I thought, though, it, it might be, you know, we'll be having lunch shortly. So I thought we could possibly round off if every one of the speakers could just say one thing that they will take away from this conference. Shall we start with our two conference speakers who are on Zoom? Shall we start with Kathy? Ah, of course, put me on the spot. Um, no, I, I've really enjoyed watching the conference. I wish I were there. I thought there, there was something in every, every talk. Um, you know, I usually go away from these conferences just feeling so happy. And I feel that way, even though I'm not there in person. So I'm taking away that sense of um, just friendship and well, camaraderie, what I what I actually alluded to in my talk that um, it's always such a such a welcome to be there. And I felt the same just even watching you remotely. So thank you all for that. Thank you, Kathy, and 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 Paul. Um, I know you, you haven't been able to join in many of the sessions, but um, I was wondering if you could give your sort of thoughts on being invited to speak to us. Well, I'll give you my word; it's Ebb's fleet. <laughs> um, and uh, well, I, I would like to thank you for for inviting me because it made me. Um, I'd read some of her novels before. Um, well, she was then rediscovered, but shortly after she was rediscovered because I was still very much connected with the International African Institute at that stage. And um, we all took note of the fact that the person who'd been the editorial assistant of Africa was now a famous novelist. And I read one or two of the novels uh, with great enjoyment. Um, 
the, then this invitation came and I read Quartet in Autumn and I, I thought this was really quite, you know, it's a, a different experience. This is a, if, if ever the comparison with Jane Austen made sense, it made sense in, in terms of Quartet in Autumn, which is not, I mean, I can see why people don't enjoyed, who've enjoyed a lot of the earlier books because they're, they're comic books and you, you laugh out loud. But Quartet in Autumn, you don't really laugh out loud, but you can savour the flavour of what has been written. Um, and it's her sense of place and the sense of absurdity of, of humans performing as they do in order to try and square the circle and make things good between people often with great difficulty and it's all bodged together and so on and she has that sense of um, people constructing their lives making making their lives make sense and it's a very anthropological insight so the, th the big thing I've learned from preparing my talk when challenged to say something about a novelist among anthropologists was in the end how much uh, Barbara Pym was was one of us she became an anthropologist and that last book I think you can read it as an anthropology book as much as you read it as a great novel thank you that's really insightful so um Paula what would you like to take away from? Well, it's been lovely us? for me. Um, I know I've met a couple of people. Kathy, we've done Zooms together, and Deb, I've got to know you, and Yvonne. Um, but I've never been to a PIM conference before, so I wasn't quite sure what to expect. Um, and I've been delightfully, not that I knew it would be wonderful, but there's something very special about the location. Um, I was lucky enough to stay in a room with a wonderful view down to the river. And if ever I felt close to, to Pim, and I thought a lot about that young girl who came from quite geographically close to where, where I lived. And she went to school in Heighton in Liverpool, where you know, I, I know very well. Um, as I said to you, Patheli, all these places she holiday with our family, Clandudno, Patheli, these great. I loved what you said, Deb, about the Welsh. I think you're absolutely spot on about the Welsh, very important. Um, so, but I was also last night when I went back to bed and couldn't sleep because, you know, I don't know what time I'm on. It was the zone I mean, even. And I just looked out of the window and I just sort of tried to put myself in the shoes of what that would have felt like for Barbara in the 1930s, you know, to early 30s to come and look out because she did have a high room and to feel like you're in a completely different world. And then I heard the church bells this morning and I just did a little video so I can take it home with me. And, and I just really, that's what I'm going to take away. Of course, meeting these one, all of you wonderful people. And thank you so much for supporting the book. And I'm glad you don't hate it. Because um, I was really worried, you know, it's um, my, my husband wrote a biography of John Clare and, and he always worried about the John Clare Society because he said they know so much. And I said, I know, and the PIM Society knows so much and I know I'm going to get things wrong, but, you know, I'm going to do my best. And so I thank you all for being so supportive. And I know I've got some things wrong and I thank you for those who've reached out and put me right. Um, and I'm really grateful. But the thing I am going to take away I really do think is this fabulous location. How lucky are we to be here at St. Hilda's? And, and I really want to thank Deb because she has been incredible. And we're so lucky, don't you think, to have Deb? She does so much. And, you know, she's become a great, great friend. And, and I hope that you're going to be my friends too. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Beverly. Well, of course, I arrived with the storm, <laughs> so I'll always remember this trip. <clears throat> but I've been thinking, you know, everything has, even though we have all these problems with the, you know, the flight and all this stuff I had to go through with all these COVID tests, every time it would always work out. And I kept thinking in the back of my mind about Barbara Pym, like sitting up there and Hillary and of course, dear Ellen Miller and my friend Frances McMean, who's also gone, all of these Pym connections. I just felt like they were keeping an eye on me. So here I am. So I'll, I'll remember that and how special this group is. Thank you. And why you go? And whole experience is like a new world to me. And thank you very much. Um, Dave to pick me without knowing me <laughs> and it's just you know, and I told everyone in Japan that I gave talk 
in Oxford, so <laughs> <laughs> so they don't know anything about you know what I talked about, but just the highlight of my life really, and then sitting with these wonderful people and you know that bi biographer and the published book, so it's just amazing for me for three days. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> I think for me, I'm finally going to take the plunge to try and read some PIM in translation. Because um, I was really inspired by Mayuko's talk and Beverly's talk about, um, you know, translations of PIM into Japanese and into French. And in particular, with Jap uh, the Japanese culture being so different from a European culture. Um, and, you know, clearly readers around the world can appreciate the humour and the sort of whimsy of the novels and and i'd like to have a go at reading um, a translation into um bizarrely my french is better than my italian but um i i'm definitely going to have a go i think at uh, at least one of them you know very soon to see to see how i get on well it's time sorry oh okay lorraine uh, wants to say something before we finish uh, we have to get over to the dining hall within the next five minutes. Uh, but of course, we have to be back here at Help Us Too for the dramatised readings as well. Okay, this is this is going to be quite short, but before we, we break for lunch, and I know that some of you are going to shoot off soon after lunch, so I think there's something very important that we need to say, and um, Paul has already thanked Deb, but... I just want to say what a wonderful weekend this has been. I think I speak for everybody. It's been such a brilliant, brilliant conference and all the sweeter for having waited for it for two years. The fact that we're here at all and the fact that we've had such a wonderful weekend is due in huge part to Deb. We, we owe her a huge, huge debt of thanks for all that she's done for the organization of the weekend, often under very difficult circumstances. <laughs> So Deb, here is a little token of our pre appreciation if you'd like to come and claim it. And thank you so, so much. Is this, is this the leftovers from last night? <laughs> oh, thank you ever so much. Thank you, thank you ever so much, all of you. And thank you all for coming here. Um, uh, and um, I hope you'll those of you who are here this afternoon uh, continue to enjoy the day and um, perhaps if you've got time hang around after tea and uh, have a chat as well okay because i'm staying here tonight um that's great and thank you to all our speakers for their wonderful contributions I don't know when, I, when I've enjoyed a conference more, actually. I mean, we, we've had a really high quality of speakers, haven't we? And now I invite you all to head over to the dining hall and have some lunch. <laughs>